Today's water fellow is Erwin Nickelberg, and he is going to talk about analysis of resilience and drought. The drought is a big So, struggling with the life of the talking that just has not happening. Mm -hmm. And we dropped the papers, but that's all good. No all problem. Good. He's going to be fascinating, I assure you. Are you ready? Yes. All right, Thank give you. him some love, all right? Can everyone hear me? Slight technical difficulties. Uh, so I don't know if there are any introverts in the room, but if you know who you are, and you know how terrifying this is. I'm gonna give it my best shot. I'd like to talk to you today about resilience, a very sexy word that gets thrown around a lot, and, but is actually very, very difficult to pin down and understand. What is resilience? And how can we use a systems approach like DSRP to better understand it and wrap our minds around it? To answer this, I will walk you through the progress of my own thinking from, on resilience from a linear kind of traditional approach to a systems thinking approach. Fortunately, Derek and Laura caught me at a crucial time in my own uh, PhD development and helped me to learn the error of my linear ways. And uh, you will see the evolution of that thinking throughout this presentation. Why does resilience matter? Well, let's look at some projections from one of my climate change co-conspirators. You'll notice this is a projection of moisture going 50 years back and 100 years into the future. This is the world today. It's already pretty scary. We're seeing droughts in North America, droughts along the Mediterranean basin. Uh, California is still recovering from a mega drought. And as we go into the future, we're seeing those droughts becoming more and more pervasive and more and hitting and more and more severe. And some of the hardest hit parts of the world will be where the most vulnerable people live, where the poorest live, who are therefore least able to cope with these shocks and these droughts. So as an economist, and if you've ever met an economist, you know this is true, I think I am trained to think linearly, and that is my cognitive bias. So we think of resilience in this linear fashion. You have some sort of measure of well being right here. This is a measure of whether or not you're experiencing hunger. You experience a, sh a shock like drought, your well being goes down, and then you recover. And then we measure how long it takes you to recover. It's simple, it's straightforward. And uh, it makes impact evaluation easy, but it's not really satisfying. It doesn't give you the whole rich picture of what resilience is. So what are we missing? Oof, this did not come out well. Well then, <laughs> uh, taking a DSRP approach, we can think of resilience as mediating the relationship between shocks and well-being. And uh, this is all squished together here, but within each of these components, you have a series of uh, subcomponents, drought, floods, food security, uh, social, social capital, human capital, and resilience itself, which is thought to be supported by a number of characteristics. However, we, in addition to this relationship that mediates shocks and well-being, we also have two different observers with their own perspectives. We have the policymaker who looks at what can be observed and what can be quantified. These are things like meteorological droughts, the map you saw earlier, uh, human capital in terms of years of education, assets in terms of number of cows, things that we as enumerators and surveyors can go out there and count and quantify and put into our spreadsheets. So that's what we care about. What does the farmer care about? Well, the farmer cares about themselves and what is important to them. They care about their well-being and how all these things that we measure, whether it's human capital, food security, social capital, feeds into that well-being. They care about their assets, but they also care about their informal networks, their families, their friends, how those help them cope. And when it comes to drought, they don't care so much about what the satellite says. They care about the drought's effect on their own crops. Also, notice, in neither case is resilience being directly observed. 
we cannot directly observe resilience. So if you're a PhD student like me and you notice this, you're like, well, I guess this is it. You know, I wonder if they're hiring at the Taco Bell. But I persevered and I dug into some of the literature in my own field and into some similar fields. And so this is going to be technical, but uh, hold on to your seats. This is a plot of well-being over time, where you'll see, you see have current well-being and future. At any given time, is only going to improve. Your well-being at time t plus one is better than your well-being at time t. It means that you're on a good trajectory. Everything gets better every day. If you're in the yellow zone, however, because of a variety of factors that are well documented, whether it's lack of assets, lack of access to insurance, lack of access to credit, you are stuck. And in fact, if you try and escape from this point, every subsequent day is going to be worse than the day before it. This is a lot like the life of a PhD student. You end up stuck here in what we call a poverty trap. So we want to know more about these two regimes and what leads people to be in one regime or the other. Empirically, that is very hard for us to observe because you have this data and data is inherently noisy. However, we can approximate this noisy data with two linear approximations. So I used a machine learning technique called a hidden Markov model. In essence, what it does is it premises that the observed outcomes Y here, which in this case are our welfare outcomes, are premised on an unobserved regime state that also progresses over, that is linked over time. And we can therefore infer this regime based on the outcome Y. To look at, uh, to bring it home and look at, you know, make this real for people, this is our case study in Chikwawa, Malawi, which to, in 2015 was hit by a massive flood, and then in 2016 was hit by a massive drought. Uh, it's really one of the most vulnerable places in the world that's already suffering the effects of climate change. The yellow dots here represent the households we sampled in Malawi. When we look at the history of shocks across the five months of sampling, what we see is drought and an increasing severity of drought over time. Almost 80% of people are experiencing drought. But we also see a host of other shocks. And interestingly, these shocks are interrelated. For example, if you experience drought, you're also much more likely to experience a rise in food prices. If you experience flooding, you're more likely to experience illness because of waterborne illnesses like cholera. So again we, again, we see how this is not linear, this is not simple. There are these interlocking dynamics that have to be accounted for. So recalling our poverty trap model, where we had these two equilibria, I used the hidden Markov model to plot two different states of well-being. One good state, you know, up here where your welfare is high and it's relatively stable, that you can see that by the narrow distribution. And one bad state where your welfare is not only low on average, but is also very variable. So you don't know from one day to the next or from one month to the next how well you're going to do. And you're much more likely to suffer, you know, the vagarities of the slings and arrows of fortune, as Hamlet would say. What this enables us to do, once we can infer which regime and household is in, we can then determine whether or not there anything we can do to get these households out of that regime or, or improve their state. This is uh, something called a Markov transition matrix. In essence, it's you know, a mathy term, but essentially all it means is what's the probability, given that you're in a good place today, of being in a good place tomorrow versus moving to that bad place. So if we look at households who are not receiving any government assistance, what we see is if you're in a good place today, you have about a 50-50 chance of being in that same good place tomorrow or following back into the bad place. If you're in a bad place today, you've got an 89% chance of staying in that bad place. That is classic poverty trap. That means that once you're there, you're stuck. However, there's good news. 
if we provide assistance, and usually in terms of food assistance or employment, not all, when you're in a good place, you're much likely to stay in that good place. You're much likely to fall into the, less likely to fall into that poverty trap. And when you're in the bad place, you've got, you know, it's still not great. You still got a 60% chance of staying in the poverty trap, but you've got a much better chance of emerging out of it and actually pulling yourself out of poverty onto that good recovery trajectory. So to summarize, um, we see a lot, to summarize, DSRP and a systems thinking approach allowed me to really rethink my research and reshape it to somewhat of a breakthrough in our methodology, which allowed us to observe the unobservable and focus on what really matters.